All right, boys. Can you hear me, Shay? Yes, sir. Okay, we're here. The man, the myth, the legend, J.D. Pickhill from all three. What's up, brother? How we doing, baby? We're here, huh? Yeah. We're here. This is the unofficial official kick it is. of the whole deal. And it's, we're here. It's amazing. It's just a snowball effect after this. It's just one thing after another. I'm listening to these coaches talk. I mean, their kids are going to be showing up on campus before long. And uh, I just pumped up, brother. I am pumped up for some SEC football. When that fall camp hits, too, it's like, all right, now we're all so real. Like, we got actual rosters on the field. Nobody's <laughs> in the portal, hopefully, you know, yeah. Lord willing. <laughs> it's fun, man. It's, it's now, great. Do you, because uh, you cover all teams. Sure. So, do you go to all the media days or just the ones that are winning national championships? <laughs> <laughs> So far, just the ones winning national okay. championships. Uh, however, with that being said, Michigan. Yeah, I know. You know, uh, I, I, we, I don't think we have Big Ten on the books just yet. Yeah. But we'll see. But we'll see. Yeah. Speaking of cameras, can you see yourself here? I'm, can I just kidding. Oh, okay. I was, I was like, I was, uh, I was, a little Michigan so. joke. Didn't hit. We we'll work on it. We'll oh, edit it man, out. That was yeah. good. That was good. I, that's on me. That was a little a good too one. early. That's on me. That's on me. Who, who are you most excited to hear about? Uh, at, from this event, I think anytime Lane Kiffin touches the mic, yeah. everyone kind of like stops what they're doing. And I'm sure probably even the SID at Ole Miss gets a little, is a little tense, yep. making sure he doesn't yeah. say anything, you know, too off the rails. <laughs> but I mean, the perception around Ole Miss coming into this year, I can't remember the last time they had this much excitement. I yeah. mean, we're not just talking about them making the playoff; we're talking about them maybe winning the league, which is right. which is kind of wild to say. And even if they don't win the league, ten and two probably gets you into the dance. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited to hear from them, excited to hear about how they're handling that kind of pressure and those expectations. Because i tell you what, man, Jackson Dart, uh, very excited to see what he does for an encore. Yeah. Because it's funny, this time last year, too, we were saying, who's going to be the guy at Ole Miss? Is it Jackson Dart? Is it Spencer Sanders? Right. And then now we're like, is Jackson Dart going to win the Heisman? You know, it's just it's funny the difference a year makes, but that's that's what I'm watching for sure. Yeah. And, want, it, it, do you think oh. it's good for college football, though, that, um, I mean, I realize if you're an Alabama fan or Georgia fan, you want to just dominate Ohio State, on and on and on. But I love the fact that we live in an era where an Ole Miss, I'm not saying they're going to win the national championship, but it's a, it's a realistic question to ask. Missouri, can they, can they win the SEC? I, I think that is fantastic for our sport. Yeah, and I think it's credit to those schools too, Missouri, with all they did trying to you know, pump some uh, some life into the, the NIL side of things and the way they're recruiting right now and um, Ole Miss, the way they've attacked the portal. Like, I think you are starting to see these different blueprints start to take more and more shape. We're seeing more proof of concept from a school like an Ole Miss with the way they use the portal and uh, Missouri showing, hey, if you care enough about your football team, you're going to give us enough greenbacks, like we can, yeah. we can get some big-time players in our, in our recruiting class. So I think that's a really interesting thing to watch here as the sport continues to evolve is the two schools have thought of how much do you need to use the portal? How much do you need to give to NIL to win a national championship? And so uh, we're going to get some good data here over the course of the next couple of years, but some uh, some good early early returns for uh, the folks in Oxford, no doubt. Yeah. Well, I mean, we went to the, your huge on three event there in Nashville, <laughs> had all them recruits in. I mean, it was it was absolutely crazy, and uh, it, it got me thinking. You know, is we're on we're on a tra- we're, I mean we're on a trajectory right now, and and do you see this? sustaining you know the next couple of years or do you you sense some sort of intervention saying hey we got to put some buffers on this thing with when I, i'm referencing in a nil yeah, and the transfer yeah. portal i mean full transparency i hope there's no buffers put on it strictly yeah. because i'm like hey if you care enough about football you can go and prove that and go and put all of your eggs in that basket and go get big time players and, yeah. and you know win at the highest level and i, I hate the idea transparently of saying okay well that's great you care, but you can only use this much money because that's not fair because, you know, X, Y, and Z school, the Cornells of the world don't want to put so much money towards football. Yeah. So I, I like the fact, I mean, we got, it just means more written behind y'all on a wall over there. If it means that much to you and you want to put your money where your mouth is, like you can, you can have that translate to the field. So I love that personally. Um, will that be the case? There are people that make a lot more money and are a lot smarter than me that will make those decisions. <laughs> However, I would love to see the, the playing field stay uneven for, well, just, for that fact. I think it's just great. Like you said, you got Ole Miss. Here's a team. They're like, okay, this is it. And yeah. the boosters kick in. And maybe this year, you know, we see it with Mizzou or somebody else, you yeah. know, another school that's not maybe traditionally at that BCS or national championship spot, you know, now have an opportunity. So I'm all for it. And why should they, too, to your point? Like, if Ole Miss says, we care about football this many dollars worth, 
why should they be hamstrung and forced to be yeah. at the level of, well, hey, school X doesn't want to spend that much or can't spend that much, so that's not fair. I'm kind of like, hey, equal opportunity, to my understanding, is what this country was built on, what college <laughs> football was built on, all right? So, I mean, let's let's make that happen. Yeah, and, and I was on a, an Oklahoma show about a week or two ago, or maybe a little bit longer, right before they, they went into the SEC mm-hmm. officially, and they asked me a question, and I've been thinking about it ever since, but... Let me ask you same same question. What do you think is closer to reality that Texas and Oklahoma are in for a rough reality and all these SEC homers like us are completely right, like they ain't ready, this ain't Big 12 shenanigans, or is it the rest of the SEC who's, we've been saying that for damn near, since we've been alive, really, sure. you ain't ready, this is a different animal. Will they be surprised just at how competitive and how good Texas and Oklahoma are immediately? I think the latter is closer to reality, in my really? opinion. Yeah. I do think that there is going to be a learning curve for Oklahoma and Texas. I think that is, there's no mistaking that. That's a non-negotiable. It will be a very different ball game than you know whatever the Big 12 is week in and week out. The grind of it week right. in and week out is just brutal. So I think in that way, the margin for error shrinks quite a bit. But I look at both those rosters, and I mean, we're sitting here in July, so we're just going off of what that piece of paper says right now that's got the names and the numbers and all that in the hometowns. Um, but both of those, I think, are set up to be really successful sooner rather than later. Now, Texas is a school I've been pretty transparent and pretty high on going into the season. Um, Oklahoma, it's tough to replace your whole offensive line and go into the toughest conference, line of scrimmage conference, rather, in all of America. That's going to be a a bit of a calibration, I'd have to imagine. So I think when we look at what they're going to be long term, I think they'll 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 be okay acclimation wise. Um, I'm just not so sure that just because the grind is more difficult for an Oklahoma and for a Texas that they're just automatic wins. If that makes sense, like I think South Carolina, Oklahoma, if they play tomorrow, I'd probably pick Oklahoma. When LSU and Oklahoma play, probably lean LSU because you feel good about the offense. But what if that defense isn't you know as as much of a um, if they don't take steps that we thought they would take this offseason with Blake Baker. So there, there's a lot of variables that we're looking at here, but um, I do think they'll actually fit pretty well, and I guess we're about to find out here well, in about a month. And to your point, I was trying, trying to look up the schedules here. I think Texas and Oklahoma, mm-hmm. at face value, they can beat any team in this league, maybe short of Georgia, just because mm-hmm. Georgia's on a different plan, planet. But you can say that about any team in the country. Mm-hmm. They probably can't beat Georgia short of maybe Ohio State. But – Oklahoma last last month at Ole Miss, at Mizzou, Bam at home, at LSU. You can beat any of those teams, I truly do think. Mm-hmm. But can you beat them all in a row? Yeah. That's when it becomes real. And even I I know I'm not as high as on US Texas. I've been <laughs> saying that for months. But even Texas schedule, I'm not looking at it. I couldn't find it. But I think it's Florida at home, it's at Arkansas, it's Kentucky at home, and it's at AM. Mm-hmm. They get Again, Georgia at home. Georgia at home. Mm-hmm. I mean, every, but specifically those last four. I think even everyone here would agree. Texas beats those teams if they played today. But how about at the end of the year? Yeah. What if Florida's better than you? Like you and I think Florida's going to be better. Yeah. What if they're better? What if he loves Kentucky? What if Kentucky's a 9-10 win team again, which is not that unrealistic? Mm-mm. All of a sudden, you're not getting those games in the Big 12. I think that's, that's when it could catch up to you. No, I'm 100% with you. And we saw it too with Quinn Ewers, like hasn't played a full season of college football. And, like, yeah. I mean, yeah. God bless Texas, but if, if you don't have Quinn Ewers against those teams you just mentioned, it's a very different beast than playing without Quinn Ewers against uh, Kansas State or against uh, Houston or, you know, whoever you want to fill in the blanks there within the Big 12. And that's not knocking the Big 12. It's just that's what you signed up for for Texas. You came here to play against the best of the best. And so, like we said, with that being the case, the margin for error goes down quite a bit in this conference. So, the, the week in and week out grind really is that variable I'm with you of how do they react to that, how do they acclimate to that. I think the entry point too is interesting. Texas coming off of last season and the momentum and they got like 70% production back even though they lost a lot in the wide receiver room. There's no doubt about that. Um, they have pieces I think right now to be more competitive which isn't saying much. Oklahoma, you're like first year quarterback, new offensive line. I love the weapons. I like I like the the raw ingredients, but like you said, the the day in and day out grind, week in and week out grind of the SEC, uh, it'll reveal something for sure. We'll find out. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> the off season is message board season, yep. and <laughs> and one of the things that that we you know we're talking about Texas, Oklahoma joining, but you know you cover in other conferences, two teams that keep popping up over and over, Florida State, Clemson. 
Notre Dame even. Yeah. Have you have you heard any – five years from now, is SC, I know Sankey shut it down, but he's, he's also shut down a lot of other sure. stuff before, and then it ended up happening. <laughs> but five years from now, are we still at 16 in the SEC? Five years from now? Five, five years from now. That's a great question. I, I have that's a great, that's now a great now. question. Yeah. My, uh, Give us a great answer. My gut, <laughs> my, gut re- <laughs> my gut reaction is yes, which probably isn't, isn't the great answer we were looking for here. I just think the Big 12 is going to be in attack mode. I think they are going to pounce on anything and everything they can find that will be worth you know their time to add to that conference in the arms race right now. I think if you're the SEC, you can kind of sit back and say, okay, you know what is what is really an addition for us is adding you know the Florida States and the Clemsons is that really moving us to where we want to be long term and there are people again that work in that world that have a better answer for that than me if it were me I'm saying yeah those are two massive brands let's add them to the conference if we can get them let's go but um, I do think there is something to be said too of how much do you want to split up the pie now I get the pie probably gets a lot bigger when you add those two schools but my, my gut is that We'll probably see them sit at 16 for the next five years. But once we go to the Super Conference era, I think at that point, you know, yeah. we'll see the SEC and the Big Ten explode. Wait, you got me thinking about something. And I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a good while, and I just want to pick your brain because I'm, yeah. I'm kind of a hot take-ish type guy, obviously. But Arch Manning, because yeah. you, were t- you were referencing Quinn Ewers. Let, and I don't think this is highly unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Let's say Texas loses to Oklahoma, which they just lost to, and Georgia. And Quinn Ewers struggles in those games. I mean, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility they make the switch to Arch Manning. And, I mean, we just saw it with the video game. I'm not in the game. I'm in the game. I mean, that's, that's all good and fine. Make sure, your money. Sure. But, again, it's, it's not quite like they're just sitting back and Arch is drinking Kool-Aid. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they, there's a lot on the line here. And if he's Texas starting quarterback... Let's say they lose to Oklahoma and they make the switch, and he beats Georgia. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that, I think that's a reality, but it, it could also divide the locker room. I think there's a lot. I guess the point that I'm trying to make in this rambling question is that I think Arch Manning, will he, won't he play? You know, I think that is a, a, a storyline that is not being talked about enough mm-hmm. that could be an issue. Would you buy into any of that at all? I think the storyline I could buy into is if we see Quinn Ewers – unable to stay healthy, and we see kind of a Drew Bledsoe-Tom Brady thing happen, yeah. where Quinn Ewers goes down, and then Arch Manning goes in and just lights it up, and you're like, hey, man, like, Quinn, you're our guy. You're on the cover of College Football 25. You led us to a college football playoff berth, but, like, 16 is lighting it up. I, in good faith for this football team, cannot take him out of the lineup. I think that's the only way I could see him being the guy at Texas for this season. To me, it's like Quinn Ewers has your locker room. Like you mentioned, I think Quinn Ewers being in year three in the system is going to be massive. And I um, mean, quite frankly, too, as good as Arch Manning is, the learning curve in playing college football, the first, you know, I, I wouldn't feel great if I'm a Texas fan or someone on that staff saying, all right, first year in the SEC, go get him, you know, even right, if your last right. name is Manning. So I could buy the Bledsoe Brady situation. I think it's Quinn Ewers, though, as long as they have meaningful football to play. And Texas fans are currently yelling <laughs> at the speakers. There's no quarterback controversy down here. But the uh, fact they have to say that tells me there is. Yeah. And 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 it, another one that I was going to use an example, Jalen Hurts to a – Yeah. You know, that yeah. and, and that was handled well because Jalen Hurts is a unique individual. There, I don't think I don't know that there's another – and that's no shot on anybody, but sure. I, I just don't know – if there's another quarterback in college football today that would handle it the way Jalen Hurts did. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. I think that's totally fair. And, again, I really do think it's unless something catastrophic were to happen, I I think he's your guy. And I think he came back understanding that Arch Manning was was behind him and was going to be a force. But I also think that Arch Manning came to Texas with the understanding of I am going to bide my time. When it's my time to play, I'll be ready. Um, I think that the Manning camp is probably playing chess long term. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that's kind of my, my, my thought on it. But, again, if, if viewers can't stay healthy and, and Arch gets a chance, uh, that's where it gets really interesting. Well, on that same note, you know, because Mike's higher on the Florida Gators than I am. But that's all we're going to hear all offseason. Like, if as soon as Florida loses two, three games, it's going to be like, when are we going to when are we going to pull Mertz? Right, you know? right. Do you do you see something like a scenario where maybe uh, DJ gets a little bit more playing time than than most freshmen? I could see some packages for him personally, yeah. just with how good of an athlete he is. I could see maybe working him into some 
some goal line stuff and maybe getting his feet wet. I think some of the, the luxury for him, and Pete Nakos had a great article on this on all3.com, the luxury for him is he's not being thrust into a situation where, where he has to be the guy. He gets to learn. He gets to sit behind Mertz. And um, I think Mertz, too, with all the weapons they got him this offseason, second year for him in the system, like I'm, I'm pretty excited about what he's going to do for an encore out there in Gainesville because, again, we're – we're on the same page here. I don't know that it was quite as bad as a lot of folks made it out to be. I think if he stays healthy, they probably beat Missouri, which changes the narrative for their season yeah. quite a bit. And so I like Graham Mertz. I think he, I think he is uh, obviously a guy to watch here in 2024. And um, so to answer your question directly, I think it's Mertz's job as long as they have meaningful football yeah. to play, as long as he's healthy. That is such a tough spot, though, because if they do struggle, you got to wonder if Billy will will say, "I need something to, for the fans sure. to, you know, bring me back." Sure, because. Fair or not, the the moment Billy Napier gets fired, which is a huge if, but the moment it happens, on three is going to write DJ Lagway <laughs> to the portal. You know, sure, not everybody, yeah, everybody, yeah. not I've just, everyone's I've watching just that. Yeah, that's the but yeah, everybody's going to. That's that's going to be the next question for totally. everybody in college football. So I don't know. And, and heck, I mean, Billy Napier could return, and DJ could still get in the portal because mm-hmm. that's that's. I mean, that's where we're at. But what a tough spot to be in. You know, it's tough man. <laughs> and I think the t- the thing too with that is. We talk a lot about Florida. If it is six and six, if it is seven and five, how does that look? Mm-hmm. And so they could be sitting there, at, you know, let's call it four and four. Is that reason for panic? Is it hey, throw DJ the keys and, and kind of get this new era started? If Merch is looking great, or is it hey, we got to find a way to look as good as possible in this diabolical stretch we've been dealt from the SEC? <laughs> we got to have a guy who's played a lot of football in Graham Merch and try and salvage this. So. It's a, it really is between a rock and a hard place in some sense. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, cousin Shane, he wants to ask this question, but he doesn't want to come off as a huge homer. So I'll ask it for him. <laughs> How many Heisman's will Nico win at Tennessee? <laughs> Ooh, I, I mean, there is uh, there is cause to believe he can win one. Right, There's over cause under to half. Believe, where would, where would yeah. you go with that? If let's let's say he plays, let's, I know this is probably unrealistic. Let's sure. say he plays three more years. Let's go. I'll take the over on that. Yeah. I'll take the over on that. I mean, I, I understand. It's July, so we haven't seen the guy who played just yet, but the, the amount of ability he has and also the system he's in. Like, he's if Tennessee is playing good football, he is putting up ridiculous numbers, and we've seen how this thing is supposed to work, too, with Henry Hooker. Like, I mean, when yeah. they had him and Jalen Hyatt, this thing was humming, and I think they have maybe not a Jalen Hyatt caliber kind of receiver in that room right now, but they got a lot of really good ones that I think can stretch the field and do more for you this season compared to last season, and um, the maturity for Nico too that everyone talks about I think maybe gets overlooked a little bit in regards to all of his physical abilities but the way that he's handling being the rumored eight million dollar man and he's you know the the hope of Tennessee like he's taken all that it seems like in really great stride you hear nothing but great things out of the, the Tennessee camp and how he handles the locker room and won that team over and so uh, I'm excited for that man I don't know that we've had a player have as much hype around him coming into his first season as starting quarterback since, I mean, Mike, what do you think, Tebow? I mean, is that <laughs> is that accurate? Like, it's, it's been a long time since we've had someone with that much juice and a place like Knoxville is obviously starving for, uh, for a big-time winner. Yeah, no, I, that's a great point. I hadn't thought about that either. But I, to all the stuff we're talking with, NIL, Portal, and stuff, I, one thing I think that, you know, because a lot of fans hate it and, and they I wish it was back the way it was and all this, but... I think what doesn't get talked about enough, I don't, I don't know if you, you saw this, but it was last week I saw it for the first time, Mike Griffith from Dog Nation. He was saying that Carson Beck got told he'd be a late first-round pick, hmm. and he was given an NIL package at Georgia that matches a late first-round, like a, like a Bo Nix. Well, Bo Nix was, I think, top ten. But you know what I'm saying, like sure. millions of dollars, which I think that's awesome. Because that that is true NIL. That your value to Georgia is astronomical. Because with you back, you are the you are picked to win it all. And if you have a great season, you know many people are projecting him as number one overall. He'll sure. make 40, yeah. 50, Like it, it it works for everybody. But I I guess what I'm trying to ask you is I I think that's great for football too. Because to our point to Nico, like in two years he may be like a fringe first rounder. I just think it's it's awesome that a guy can come back, get paid, take an insurance policy. And work his way to become even better. When years before, these guys don't have money, a lot of them, and they they make that they rush that decision because they know a payday's coming, but it may not be anywhere close to what they can actually get when they fully develop. 
Absolutely. And it, and it helps you. And I, it's funny to say keep the main thing the main thing because when you're getting paid a whole lot of money, that is in some ways probably the main thing for you to a degree. There's no way around that. I think we can all agree there. But I think the fact that he can develop even further and put himself in the very best position to when he's going to be a professional. Like, I mean, let's, let's take football out of it. If I'm a junior in college and they tell me, hey, you have a chance to work at this radio station and you'll make X amount of money, but if you stay another year and we'll, you know, we'll make it worth your while, get you some nice housing, you could go to this, this station, you know, you'll get taken care of. It's like, okay, well, great. If I can progress even further professionally and help myself financially, yeah. like, it's a no-brainer for everybody. And so I'm with you. I think it kind of helps us all get the best product out of college football. And then also, if you're the NFL, you want Carson Beck to be successful. He's the first overall pick. You want yep. to have the very best product on the field on Sunday. So I think it makes a ton of sense in a lot of a lot of respects. I got one. Uh, just quarterbacks. You know, obviously, we talked about Nico. You know, uh, Arnold's getting a lot of hype. A lot of these new quarterbacks that are coming in. But I am curious, the ones that we're not talking about, mm. we're talking South Carolina. We've, we've got Kentucky's got it, Brock. You know, we've uh, even Garrett, you yeah. know. Um, which one are you looking at to have a big year this year? Maybe that people should be talking about, but they're not. I love Garrett Nussmeyer, man. Yeah. I do. I, I mean, we talked last year about Jaden Daniels, and we were all saying kind of the same thing, like, hey, great athlete, good passer, but, like, he's got to push it deep. we got to be able to unhitch the wagon a little bit here. Yeah. And then he did, and he won the Heisman. Nobody's saying, man, I wish Garrett Nussmeyer would throw it deep. Nobody's saying, I wish you, I wish you had a little more gunslinger too, you know? So, I mean, with how open that offense is going to be, even with Mike Denbrock gone and even with two first-round picks gone, they still have some, some great weapons for him to throw the football to. They're still going to push it deep, and I think he'll thrive. If he can calibrate the decision-making part of things, which I think was massive for him to sit behind Jaden Daniels and have that time to learn um, in that system, I think he's going to have a tremendous season. And you mentioned Vandergriff too. Yeah. Just because you didn't play at Georgia doesn't mean you can't play at a really high level. Right. And there was there was rumblings at Dogs HQ going into even fall camp. Like, hey, Vandergriff's making it tough on this staff. Like Beck is more consistent. Beck's probably the guy, but Vandergriff, man, he's he's making it tough. So I wouldn't be surprised if he popped and had and had a big year at Kentucky. Yeah. yeah. Hey, last thing I got for you, JD, really appreciate your time. Always. In years past, let's say like November, the first week of November essentially rolls around. There's usually like two maybe three SEC teams that are like in, still in the playoff mix. How many do you think there will be this year with an expanded playoff, with an expanded SEC going basically just the last month of the season? How many fans will still have that hope, you think? I think it's going to be six. I, I really do. And it, if 10-2 and two is that price to get you in, I think we're going to see a lot of teams knocking on the doorstep. Yeah. And I'm curious, too, what happens if we get a bunch of 10-2 and two teams and it's kind of like a – like a blockade of sorts. You get a traffic jam in that 10 and 2. You know, like who, who gets left out? Is it the SEC or is it the ACC runner up? Is it the Big 12? So, I mean, there's just there's so many scenarios, but I really do think like, if it's SEC six or seven days, teams, it can't be SEC. <laughs> right, it can't, right? I mean, six or seven teams, I feel like, is very, very reasonable. And I'll tell you what, you get you get four or five teams. I think five is probably like the the more generous number to put out there for the college football play. If you get five SEC teams, I mean, yeah. it is going to be it is going to be a wild playoff. <laughs> wild, to say the least. Hey, I was at the gym this morning. Did, were you there at 7? I, or seven? There. I, mean, I think I, I missed was, you. you know? <laughs> I was in bed. I was in bed. Yeah, no, y'all. No, I was not there. I, can, I was not there. No, I sir. wasn't either. I was, I was just All right, last, uh, before you go, J.D., can you tell the audience, how can they follow you? How can they find your work? I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, on three, the YouTube channel, you type in on three into the search bar on YouTube, probably find myself or Andy Staples. One of our mugs will be in a thumbnail, and you click on that, and you'll be in good shape. But if you're a podcast person, you type in The Hard Count with J.D. Piquel, and uh, you can find all our work there. But, man, I appreciate you having us on. This is a blast. Absolutely. It's going to be a great week. We're here, boys. Let's We're do here. It. Yeah. We're here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all.